So we're now about to start first principles and first values. And if someone can put maybe the, the code, right? The part of the code that we're gonna do today in the chat box. Okay, we ready to go? The unique self is the inward space of uniquely lived experience from which meaning is discovered. The unique self is under attack in multiple ways, including the assumption of big tech and big data, that the human being is no more than a social self, the assumption of the spiritual traditions that the human being is either a true self or an obedient self, and the shared assumption of the entire rest of the world that the human being is a separate self. The cultivation of unique self-consciousness is therefore the overriding moral imperative of this moment right in history. So let's see if we can if we can find our way here. Okay. We're going to go several steps. Let's see if we can really, we're going to say, we, we want to take this really to a next level. First principles and first values. The articulation of unique self-consciousness is the overriding moral imperative of this generation. So I want to spend just now three minutes on unique self-consciousness. And we need to actually unpack this in, in great depth, right? And we'll do that in a series of weeks and first principles and first values. But right now, I just want to state it. I just want to say it and then widen the lens and see the three primary ways that unique self is challenged and why the unique self is the single most important idea in the world today to alleviate suffering, to bring hearts together to move beyond polarity and to respond to the existential risk, right? Which is quite literally the death of our humanity, right? We actually, be, we cease to be human beings in the deepest sense of what a human being means and the physical death of humanity itself. So what is unique self? A unique self says that the human being is not merely a separate self. I'm not just a skin encapsulated ego, but I'm also not merely a social self. I'm not merely in a web of social relationships. And I'm not merely one with the all, one with consciousness beyond my personal story. I'm, my true essence is I'm an impersonal participatory part of the one. I'm not just that, that's true self. Each of those has relevance. Each of those is important. I'm not just separate self. There is a dimension of the human being that's separate. Separation lives in the mind of God. That's my sense of being individuated. There's some truth to that, but it's partial. I'm much more than a separate self. I actually don't exist independently of the all. I'm a unique emergent of the all. I don't exist independently of everything. I am nothing without everything. I'm dependent on it all and it all lives in me as me and through me. At the same time, I'm not just a social self. I'm not just a node in a network that's affected right, by all of the prior causes. I'm more than that. And I'm more than pure consciousness. I'm not just awareness or awareness of awareness as the enlightenment traditions tried to tell us. Yes, I am awareness, right? Underneath my body, underneath my emotions, underneath my thoughts, there's still an I. And a dimension of that I is awareness. So I'm not just my thoughts and I'm not just my emotions and I'm not just my body, I am, right? That's true self, but, I, but, but I'm not just that. So I'm not just a separate self, it's a big deal. I'm not just a social self, right? I'm not just a, a true self, I'm unique self. And unique self says that on the one hand, I have a dignified separate self story. That's absolutely true. But that separate self story is not all I am. I'm also one with the field of consciousness, but not just the field of consciousness. I'm one with the field of consciousness, desire, eros, and intimacy. The field of consciousness is alive. It's teeming with eros, intimacy, and desire. But I'm not just one with that field. I'm a unique expression of that field. 
right? I'm a unique emergent, unlike any other. So I'm both part of a social web. I'm a separate node in that social web, but I'm not just separate, I'm one with the web. The entire web in some sense lives in me. All of consciousness lives in me. I'm affected by the whole thing and I'm a unique emergent of the whole thing. And I'm irreducibly valuable as a unique emergent of the whole thing. So that's what he, that's, that's the quality of person of that's unique self. And my uniqueness lives in an evolutionary context. And so I'm a unique expression of the evolutionary impulse itself that beats in me. And my deepest heart's desire is the desire of evolution itself. That's unique self. So unique self is the answer to the question of who are you? And I'm gonna state the unique self formula. And then with that context, we're gonna get, we're gonna dive into what we really wanna talk about today. Okay, and if you're new and you've never heard the unique self context, this is a very short statement of it. Right? And if you've been with us for a decade, right? It's getting new, newer and newer. It doesn't get older, it gets newer. It's developing every single time. And we actually experience the realization again. So who are you? Unique self is the answer to the question of who are you? You are an irreducibly unique expression. You, an irreducibly, you are an irreducibly unique emergent or an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence and love beauty, right? That is the initiating and animating eros of all that is that lives in you, as you, and through you. That never was, is, or will be ever again other than through you. And as such, you have unique capacities. And you have unique capacity to give your unique gift and to live your unique story. To give your unique gift and live your unique story that's needed by all that is. To give your unique gift that's needed in your unique circle of intimacy and influence. And to live the unique pleasures of your life and to fulfill your unique responsibility, your unique ability to respond. Your unique self is your, let's get the sentence, a new way of saying it. Your unique self is your unique response to reality. You get that? And it's very deep. Your unique self is not just reality acting on you. That's the social self. The social self says reality acts on you. Okay. There's a great sentence and we'll, we'll get to it maybe a little later. There's a great sentence in, um, in Walden. Right, I'll show you the book by B.F. Skinner. Right, so this is his utopian novel. We'll talk about him in a few, couple of minutes. Right, but there's a great sense where he says, he says, you have to set up certain behavior. Walden to is, is B.F. Skinner's utopian novel, right, about what society should be. And it's actually, in many ways, the basis for the World Wide Web. We'll get to that in a couple of seconds, but I'll just give you one sense. He says, you have to set up certain behavioral processes which will lead the individual to design his own good conduct. We call that sort of thing self-control, but says Frazier, who's the lead character in Walden too, don't be missled. Control always rests in the last analysis in the hands of society. Frazier says in Skinner's Walden too, control always rests in the hands of society. Meaning, meaning you actually don't act upon the world. You think you do, you don't. The world acts upon you. So unique self says no to that. Unique self says that you have a unique response ability. Your unique self is your unique response to reality. And that's generated internally, right? Because the field of a conscious and desire lives uniquely in you. And therefore the impulse beats uniquely in you. And therefore you're not merely responding right, to the cues that you've received through various forms of nudges and social pressures, you're actually from within acting on reality, right? So the world acts on you, but you actually act on the world. So your unique response to reality, that's your unique self, right? Wow. And that has irreducibly unique value, right? Your response to the world, your gift to the world, and your unique way of living and being. So even if you don't have a job, because machine intelligence 30 years, right, has obsoleted most of the jobs, you have a unique self and you have a unique gift and you have a unique way of living, laughing, loving, and being, right? The poem that only you can write, the song that only you can sing, the unique set of insights, the unique quality of intimacy, right? The unique 
configuration of desire that's you. Wow, that's unique self. It's big, it's huge, right? Irreducible value. And through mastering the instrument of your unique self, you actually don't alienate yourself because uniqueness is not separateness. Unique self is not separateness, right? Through mastering the instrument of yourself, you actually realize that uniqueness is not the structure of alienation. Uniqueness is the currency of connection. Uniqueness joins you with, right? Uniqueness makes you part of. Your unique self instrument allows you to play your instrument, right, in the unique self symphony. Wow. So now we have a, a narrative of communion, a narrative of, of intimate communion. Okay. So now I want to step back. So that's our that's our context. That's unique self. Now I, I want to try and do something a little bit. I'm gonna go deep with you. And I'll go deep with you because we've got to diagnose correctly what's actually happening. So what I, I want to try and share with you is, and this is, it, it's so dramatic and it's so shocking and it's so disturbing and we're going to respond to it and, 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 and the revolution has to respond to it and it's a moral imperative to actually transform this dimension of reality. So there was a very, very well-known psychologist, behavioral psychologist named B.F. Skinner. And B.F. Skinner was at Harvard for several decades. And he was a behaviorist. And Skinner talks about, and I'm gonna open his book. I've got a bunch of his books here on my desk. Skinner talks about, you know, a, a set of ideas which got, you know, profoundly attacked and really reviled, you know, really um, condemned, right? In the in the, these very very, you know, fundamental ways. Chomsky wrote a very famous essay reviling Skinner, and the reason is because the way Skinner was, the way Skinner was understanding reality. He understood the human being as being primarily what I'm calling, right, echoing Skinner, a social self. Now, and I want to try and take this slow because I want to. I want to. The reason I'm going slow is I want to. I want to try and get the steps really well to, get, to try and go deep here. So Skinner basically says, the human being is a social self. And he talks about this in a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. And he talks about this in his utopian novel published after World War II, Walden II. And Skinner is actually coming from a very important place. And he's misread and misunderstood. Now, he's wrong. The human being is much more than a social self. But where he's coming from is very important. So I want to actually read you, right, a passage from Skinner from Beyond Freedom and Dignity. Freedom says, you know, Skinner says, we need to abolish the autonomous man, the inner man, the possessing demon, the man defended by the literatures of freedom and dignity. His abolition has long been overdue. He's been constructed from our ignorance. And as our understanding increases, the very stuff of which he is composed vanishes. And it must do so to prevent the abolition of the human species. To man qua man, this autonomous man, this inner man, we say good riddance. Only by dispossessing him can we turn from the inferred to the observed, from the miraculous to the natural, from the inaccessible to the manipulable. That's an incredible paragraph. And for example, Shoshana Zuboff in Surveillance Capitalism quotes this paragraph in horror, but her horror is 
correct and incorrect. She actually doesn't understand Skinner's motivation or where he's coming from. So what does Skinner say in this paragraph? And I, I know you don't remember all of it, that's okay. What Skinner basically says is, we need a technology of social behavior. But why does Skinner say it? So Chomsky attacks him and Zuboff is aghast. Correctly so, because Skinner is basically saying, let's nullify the autonomous man and let's nullify the inner man. Now, stay with me for a second. It's gonna take us only about seven or eight minutes, not more, but we're gonna show that Skinner is the basis of social media. He's the basis of Facebook. He's the basis of Google. And that actually there's a direct line between behaviorism and Skinner and surveillance capitalism and the techplex and Google and Facebook. There's a direct line. And once you realize that direct line, you actually understand what's animating the web. And we understand therefore how we have to respond to deconstruct the web as it exists now and to actually create right, an entirely new vision right, of what the web needs to look like. We need to create a Facebook, but it's gotta be a unique self Facebook. But, but I wanna go slow, but we're gonna draw a direct line from Skinner to Facebook, but we're also gonna take issue with the people who critique Skinner like Shoshana Zuboff without actually understanding his motivation and her failure to understand his motivation and to provide an alternative actually weakens enormously, makes actually ineffective in the end, right? Her critique of the web in surveillance capitalism, just like the movie, The Social Dilemma, which was important, as is the book, Surveillance Capitalism, in the end, didn't actually understand the web, didn't understand its underlying structure and the motivations of the people were trying to animate it that way. So it reviled them and dismissed them. It reviled, right, Skinner. And Shoshana Zuboff reviles Skinner, right? And, and realizes his relationship to the World Wide Web, but doesn't understand its motivation. We've got to go much deeper. So I'm going to do something, if we can, just for a few minutes, super deep here. Okay, let's go like super, super inside. And we're literally breaking new ground in culture entirely now. And we got to kind of, kind of madly step in. Okay, so here we go. So Skinner is a utopian. We got to get this straight. Skinner's a utopian. He actually realizes that we need to recast society. And he realizes we need to recast society because Skinner realizes, and stay close with me, okay? Skinner realizes in the 50s and the 60s, right? In the 70s, as early as the middle of an early before World War II, Skinner realizes that we're facing existential risk. He was one of the first group of people who actually got existential risk. And this is something that Zuboff reading Skinner in her book, Surveillance Capitalism, completely misses. And in the passage, which I just read, what does he say in the passage? He says, right, we have to actually create, he's talking about creating a technology of behavior in order to prevent the abolition of the human species. What is the abolition of the human species? Anybody in the chat box? That's existential risk. That's what he's talking about. So what is Skinner saying? So stay with me. So in his introduction to Walden II, which is his utopian novel, he actually places himself right in the lineage of those people who tried to actually offer new narratives of human identity. So he talks about Lao Tzu, right? He talks about Buddha, right? He talks about Thoreau. In other words, Skinner and Walden too is trying to reformulate human identity. Why? Because he actually, although he doesn't cite him, although he places himself in the general lineage of new formulators of narratives of identity, he doesn't directly use Buddha's work in any direct way, but actually Skinner gets Buddha's critique of the separate self. That's big. Skinner's book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, which we'll talk about in a second, and his Walden too, is actually based on the threat of existential risk and the realization that existential risk is gonna come from a separate self gone berserk, which is exactly what Buddha was afraid of. Buddha says the separate self, the thinking that I'm only a separate self is an illusion, but that illusion creates dukkha. That illusion creates suffering. So Skinner says, yes, 
In Buddha's time, that illusion created suffering. In our time, right, as he watches the emergence of nuclear power, right, as we now add to that exponential risk, exponential technology, right, which creates exponential risk, right, the separate self doesn't just create dukkha, the separate self is going to destroy reality. The separate self is actually put together with exponential technology and nuclear power, the separate self will be the abolition of human society. That's what Skinner's talking about. Does everyone get that? When you get that, that's a huge, huge, right? Right, Duca means suffering, Joycey. Duca means suffering. Does everyone get that? So Skinner is actually realizing existential risk pretty much before everyone did, okay? And he's saying that the way to respond to existential risk is to formulate a new vision of the human being. Now, stay close with me for a second, okay? Right? Here's a book called The Abolition of Man. The Abolition of Man is written by C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis says, C.S. Lewis is writing in 1943. And C.S. Lewis says that the abolition of man is going to come because in 40, 50, 60 years, he says, he doesn't give it an exact time, but in the future, there's going to be an omnicompetent state which develops irresistible scientific technologies, right? You with me? And that omnicompetent state, which develops irresistible scientific technologies, are going to label themselves as the conditioners. They're going to be the conditioners. And they're going to go to condition human beings socially in order to have a, a socially engineered safe society. Wow. Does everyone get that? And C.S. Lewis says that's going to cause the abolition of man. But by the abolition of man, C.S. Lewis means not existential risk in the sense of the death of humanity, right? Exponential technology, nuclear proliferation, climate change, not the death of humanity. C.S. Lewis is not talking about that. He means what I'm calling the last few weeks, the death of our humanity. He's talking about the existential risk, which I've been referring to, which is not the death of humanity, but the death of our humanity. So when C.S. Lewis talks about the abolition of man, he says that's going to be brought about by the conditioners. And the conditioners are those people, in his language, who have stepped out of the Tao. T-A-O, the Tao. By the Tao, he means They've stepped out of the experience of living within intrinsic value structures, right? They've stepped into a kind of reductive scientific materialism, which says there is no intrinsic interior value in cosmos. And C.S. Lewis identifies, he talks about the Tao, this intrinsic interior value as this form of universal natural law. And he says, if we step out of the Tao, out of this natural law, which binds all human beings, <clears throat> what's going to happen is in a few generations, there's going to be new technologies and the conditioners are going to appear. And these conditioners are going to initially intend the good of reality. That's what he says, page 24, paragraph five. They'll initially intend the good of reality, but in the end, because they've stepped out of value, they've stepped out of the Tao, because in the end, they're materialists. And in the end, it's going to be the power of the few over the power of the many is it become despotic and it's going to actually destroy human beings. People will be controlled and conditioned, will no longer be human beings as we experience human beings as being. Is everyone getting this? Is everyone getting this? It's deep. Now, stay close. When C.S. Lewis talks about the abolition of man, he says it's going to happen through the conditioners Developing technologies of human behavior. Who's he referring to? He's referring to Skinner. So no one notices. No one even reads the book anymore. It's an unbelievably important book written in 1943 in the middle of World War II as we realize the emergence of human power and we realize we don't have a story equal to our power. So when C.S. Lewis talks about the conditioners who are going to cause the abolition of man, he's talking about Skinner. Not only Skinner, but he's talking about Skinner directly and behaviorism which views the human being as being a, a social self and being manipulable, which is exactly the word Skinner uses. He says, wow, that's the most dangerous thing in the world. And although Skinner hadn't yet published 
Beyond Freedom and Dignity. He published that book in 1971, and C.S. Lewis is writing in 1943, but the basic ideas of behaviorism and the conditioners and Skinner's work were already available. They were already in the zeitgeist. He was already aware of them in a, in a meta sense. And so he views the danger as being the conditioners, behaviorists, who are formed by a kind of reductive pseudo-materialist neo-Darwinism, right? a scientistic rejection of interiors, not scientific, but scientistic, a dogmatic, right? fundamentalist rejection of interiors, a stepping out of the Tao, a stepping out of value. And he says, this is going to cause what we're calling an existential risk to our humanity. He calls that the abolition of man. And he, he fought Skinner. Now stay close. Skinner then, 30 years later, says to C.S. Lewis, you got it wrong. And he uses the words, the abolition of human society. And of course, what's he saying? He's saying that those people who insist on the individual, the dignity of the separate self, which is of course the Christian tradition and the Platonic tradition, right? The Greek tradition. In other words, the Western tradition of the dignity of the separate self and the freedom of the separate self, which he's now ascribing to C.S. Lewis, that tradition that affirms, right, the value of the separate self human being, right? right that's gonna cause, he says, the abolition of human society. And notice he uses the same phrase. So there's, who's following here? There's this hidden conversation between these two great thinkers, right? You, you tracking here? It's wild. There's this hidden conversation. So C.S. Lewis is saying, without mentioning Skinner, you're going to cause the abolition of man, the death of our humanity. And Skinner says back to C.S. Lewis, you don't get it, my friend. You just don't get it. We're facing existential risk to the very existence of humanity. And that existential risk comes from, now stay close, everyone, says Skinner, comes from the separate self. Now, the Western idea is that human dignity and freedom is rooted in the separate self, right? And this is what Shoshana Zuboff gets so excited about, right? Wow. She says, how could Skinner reject the dignity of the separate self? That's crazy. You can't do that. And he embraces the social self, right? Which, which Zuboff uses as a disaster. And she's right. It is a disaster to embrace the social self exclusively as your model of self. But she doesn't get what's happening. She doesn't get that Skinner's actually responding to something important. He's responding to existential risk. Skinner's actually, he's not a crazy man at Harvard, but he's actually adopted and up-leveled Buddha's critique of the separate self, right? So he's saying, oh, Buddha's critique of the separate self is real. So just, just stay really close now. So Zuboff right, who, who gets that Skinner is kind of an antecedent to the web, right, is all aghast. How could Skinner reject the separate self? Because Zuboff is standing in the tradition of Western enlightenment, which says the separate self is the source of all dignity. This is chapter five of the Unique Self book. But Skinner has actually, although he's not quoting Buddha directly, but he's actually phenomenologically embracing that critique. And what's the critique? It's the critique of the separate self. He's saying the separate self is not the source of human dignity. That's why Skinner calls his book provocatively beyond freedom and dignity. What does he mean? What he means is we've got to move beyond the Western notion of separate self, which if you put it together with exponential technology, is going to destroy us. Because separate self causes dukkha suffering, separate self with exponential technology destroys everything, right? That is separate self with exponential technology is what we've called before rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, which is the modern success story, right? That false narrative, right? Rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, which is the modern success story, is one key generator function of existential risk. And the person who gets that is not Zuboff writing surveillance capitalism, but actually Skinner, who she's critiquing, right? He totally gets that. So what he says, Skinner, is we need a different model of self, okay? Now, Skinner, let me see if I can find you another little show and tell here. Okay, Skinner dies. 
okay? And he dies frustrated. He dies frustrated because he says, we don't have the machines and methods, right? To actually generate a technology of human behavior. And so we're gonna wind up with the abolition of human society, his words. Again, playing off of C.S. Lewis without mentioning him by name and critiquing C.S. Lewis, okay? Does everyone get that? He's saying, no, no, no. Your notion, right? Your notion of, of like the human being as a separate self who lives within these value structures is all very nice, C.S. Lewis, but that's a pre-modern idea. That's a bad idea. It's a modern idea. It's, it's a modern idea that the religions have, have made central, but it's actually wrong. We got to get rid of separate self, okay? It's a big deal. Now, now stay close with me for a second. So Skinner dies before he's able to accomplish any of this because Skinner says, lamenting, he says, I wish I had what the physicists had. The physicists, they've got real mathematical equations, right? Physics is all mathematics and they can manipulate objects and they can create all the progress of modern science. All the progress of modern science is based on right, mathematical measurements done by physicists that generate all the last 500 years of science. And Skinner says, tragically, we don't have mathematical models that allow us to develop technologies of human behavior, which map the human being and relationships between human beings. So therefore I can't get anywhere with this. Skinner dies and along comes, right, an entire new generation of data scientists. One representative, a classical representative of these data scientists I mentioned a number, of weeks ago, a number of weeks ago is Alex Pentland in a book called Social Physics. And Alex Pentland views himself, he actually shared this with our friend um, Howard Bloom, who's a senior scholar at the think tank and a great thinker, right? Alex Pentland, his nickname is Sandy Pentland, shared with Howard, he said, I'm one of the major architects of the web. And in a personal conversation a, a bunch of years ago when Howard's book, The Lucifer Principle came out. And Pentland is right. He is one of the architects of the web. And after Skinner dies, Pentland calls his book Social Physics. He never mentions Skinner because that's political suicide. But actually what he says is, is a direct continuation of Skinner. He's actually the completion of Skinner, if you will, in the following way. Pentland says, we now do have the machines and methods to do this. We have data science and data science is a new mathematics. And with this new mathematics, we can track the human being and the human being is not a separate self. That's what Pentland calls in an essay he wrote, the myth of individuality. He agrees with Skinner, right? We need to actually facilitate the death of the contemporary Western notion of individuality right? Pentland, like Skinner, is a utopian. Okay, stay close. And he writes his book, Social Physics. He has gaggles of doctoral students who've each started their own companies. And those companies are embedded in relationships with Google, with Facebook, right, with the entire techplex. They're based on the notion of a social self, but this social self now can be manipulated, and this is Skinner's word, we need to move from the inaccessible to the manipulable, but not because he wants to be manipulative in a bad way. Skinner's a utopian, but he's a utopian without first values and first principles. And that's why he's dangerous. See, Skinner's a utopian, he gets existential risk. And he, he's correct in saying that C.S. Lewis was too caught up in the separate self of Western society. But where C.S. Lewis was right is, is that you gotta live within the Tao. You have to live within frameworks of value. And Skinner has become a materialist. He stepped out of frameworks of value, right? He's, he's influenced by existentialism. He's influenced by logical positivism. He's influenced by neo-Darwinism, right? He develops behaviorism, which basically is about the human being as being an it, a social self that you can move around through social nudges and social cues and social pressure through a technology of human behavior that's mathematically develop through data science. Wow. And his, the vision that Skinner has in Walden too, of a socially engineered society, which Skinner doesn't want because he's a terrible guy. He's not a Mao or Stalin totalitarian, right? He's rather, right, a 
technocratic. He's a technocratic totalitarian, if you will, right? But he's not a totalitarian in the sense that he wants to rip your soul out, not at all, right? He's afraid of the separate self. He wants to organize human society in a way that's safe. He's a utopian, right? But he's a utopian who stepped out of the Tao. And that's where C.S. Lewis was right in the abolition of man. Right? When he talks about the conditioners who've stepped out of the Tao, and he's referring to Skinner, who's absolutely right. Skinner was also right in responding to C.S. Lewis and saying, if you just stay with the separate self, you're going to get to the abolition of human society, like playing on, on C.S. Lewis's phrase, the abolition of man. Right? He got that. But we now need to go the next step. You see, and now stay close for a second. Okay, let's stay close. So you've got Skinner and Walden, too, in this book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, which was Skinner's major book in 1971. What does Skinner mean when he says beyond freedom and dignity? He says that the old notions of freedom and dignity being based on the separate self, and all of the first five chapters of the Unique Self book are about this, right? The old notions of freedom and dignity as being based on the separate self will bring about existential risk, the destruction, the abolition of humanity. So Skinner says we've got to move to a new self, the social self. Alex Pentland, after Skinner dies, says, right, Skinner didn't have the physics to do this, but now we have social physics. So he calls his book, right, again, he calls his book Social Physics, right? And he talks about data science as the mathematical structure that's going to give us these new physics that's going to allow us, right, to actually enact this new vision of society. And who are the people that Pentland and Skinner influence? Who adopts that vision? The answer is who adopts that vision are quite literally the founders of the Techplex. Okay, so I just want you to, for a second, let's take a look for a second at, let's say, Mark Zuckerberg. So Mark Zuckerberg says, right, that our goal, right, is creating global community. Or right? our goal, says Larry Page, is a societal goal. Our goal is not incremental change, but revolutionary change, right? You actually read the texts, right? The inner text and some of the public texts of the founders of the Techplex. Let's see what happens. They adopt, they adopt Skinner's utopianism. They adopt Pentland's utopianism and Pentland directly, personally, and through, again, gaggles of doctoral students, right? Actually form companies, form partnerships. Right, throughout the Techplex. And so when the Techplex, now, now it's where it gets a little bit creepy, but you got to get the diagnosis in order to get in order to change it. So when you look at, let's say, Facebook and Google's mottos, they seem very benign and lovely. We connect people everywhere. We organize the world's information, right? We bring people closer, right? So that they can express themselves. What is this? This is These are actually expressions of Skinner's Walden too. You get that? These are expressions of the social self, which is why, notice, that the entire techplex, all the social media platforms, right, Google, Facebook, the whole story is built around social nudges, social cues, likes, social pressure, how many views you got, right, sharing your personal information. So what happens? Now no, no, stay close. Here's the mechanism. You share your data. Google collects your data doesn't ask you for it, it decides that it has a right to it. Stay close. Google says, right, six declarations. We have a right to take your data without asking you or without any real informed consent on your part. Two, we have a right to feed that data into machine intelligence. Three, we're gonna get out of machine intelligence a personality profile about you, about quote unquote, your inner demons and about what moves you, what drives you right? Four, we own that secret text about who you are. Five, we have a right to sell that text to third parties because we own it, right? And it's sold to third parties who are six misaligned with your values, right? It's sold by automatic machine intelligence driven auctions. Now, what would give Google and, and Facebook and Microsoft and Samsung, right? The list goes on. And Amazon, what would give them the right to think that they can take your data? which is the fruit of your personal experience. Only what C.S. Lewis described as a stepping out of the Tao, as a stepping out of first values and first principles, right? Once you step out of the Tao, right? 
then you're not governed. You actually become the conditioners that C.S. Lewis describes. C.S. Lewis describes these conditioners who have this benign smiling face, who say they're doing really sweet and nice things for you, and they give you all these trinkets and free apps and what's up, and they're organizing the world's information. They're connecting people everywhere, and they're bringing the world closer. But actually, what they're actually doing is fulfilling Skinner's vision of Walden II, right, and Pendlin's vision of social physics, which is based on one stepping out of the Tao. Now, C.S. Lewis got the Tao partially wrong. He actually identified the Tao or value with natural law, which actually is a weak, it's a weak idea. Natural law is not sufficient, right? There's a lot of weaknesses in natural law. It doesn't get evolution, right? So we have to critique natural law. That's correct. So we've replaced natural law with what we're calling evolving first values and first principles, which is a shared narrative of human universals that are evolving. Okay, so that's that's true and that's really important. And in, and in that sense, right, it's why people like Zuboff are so afraid to embrace first values and first principles because they identify them with C.S. Lewis's natural law. And this is where C.S. Lewis's Christianity got him in trouble. He was too influenced by Aquinas and Aquinas's view of natural law. Mistake. And right? natural law is not just eternal and unchanging. Natural law is actually, we need to replace it with an evolving perennialism, an evolving set of first values and first principles. That's one of the core pieces of work at the center. It's actually understand that unique, right, is that actually there's an evolving set of first values and first principles. Okay, so, so we got that. That's really important. Everyone get that? Everybody got that? But now let's get back to our major thread. So C.S. Lewis predicts that the conditioners will step out of the Tao, precisely Skinner. They'll step out of first values and first principles. So we're going to have then a set of utopians, utopian thinkers like Skinner and Pentland, who don't have first values and first principles. So what's the model of utopian thinking sans first values and first principles? Mao, Stalin, Lenin. It's communism is precisely a utopian move which disqualifies the universe and says there are no first values and first principles. That's a big deal. So now what do you have? So you've got Zuckerberg, Page, Brin, right? The entire techplex. The techplex actually, its interior view of itself is we're actually organizing society. Page, Brin, Zuckerberg, they talk about it all the time. Right? We, are, we are the change engine of society, right? We at this time of, of threat are going to create global community, but it looks very sweet. It's not sweet. It's creepy, right? Meaning there's a direct line between Skinner and Pentland, and Pentland, right, and, and, and data science, and the, the essential theory of data science, which says the human being is a social self. And therefore, to borrow Skinner's phrase, the human being is manipulable. Now, that's precisely half right. The human being is a social self. And you can manipulate the human being through social, social nudges and social cues. But that's precisely one quarter of the human being. Because the human being is not just a social self, right? And Skinner's critique of separate self, like Buddha's critique, is correct, but his conclusion is wrong. Skinner and Pentland, their conclusion is the data science reductive materialist conclusion. The human being is not a separate self. The human being is a social self. No. The human being is partially a social self, but that ignores an enormous amount of validated conclusion and insight, both from the exterior and interior sciences. The human being is not only a social self. Number one, the human being is also a true self. The human being is also irreducibly valuable because the human being is inseparable from the entire field of consciousness and desire. The human being, every human being participates in the one true self. And the total number of true selves in the world is one. And every enlightenment science in the world, every interior science in the world, world over, had a developed notion based on direct experimentation of a deeper notion of self than separate self and a deeper notion of self than social self. We call that true self. True self is ignored by Skinner. It's ignored by Pentland. It's ignored by the techplex. Not only is it ignored, but the techplex is built on attention hijacking meaning we're going to hijack your attention. And when your, your attention is hijacked, you don't actually have the ability to access the inward space of meaning and practice 
where you actually focus inwardly and realize through genuine practice, right? You actually realize your true identity, which is I'm not merely a skin encapsulated ego. I'm not merely the illusion of separate self. Skinner's right about that. But that doesn't mean I'm only social self. It means I'm true self. Wow. Right? I'm the quality of true self. I am consciousness itself. But I'm not only true self. I'm not only true self. I'm not only true self. I'm actually unique self. Right? Every true self, each one of us who's true self, sees through a unique set of eyes. I have a unique perspective a unique quality of intimacy and a unique configuration of eros and desire and a unique gift to give and a unique poem to write and a unique song to sing. I am an irreducibly unique expression of the love, intelligence and love beauty that is the initiating and animating eros of all that is. And so therefore the goal is not the social hive or the super organism that Pentland and Skinner talk about, let me say it again. The goal is not the social hive or the superorganism of social selves that form the social hive that's manipulated by social cues, AKA what Pentland calls the nervous system of the planet, which Pentland identifies with the web. No, that's not what we're going for. That's not our goal. That's not the strange attractor of society. Pentland and Skinner, who have been secretly, when I say secretly, meaning they're not, they're not actually not, they're not hiding it. They're just not declaring it. But Pentland and Skinner, which have formed the thinking of the techplex and of the entire enterprise of surveillance capitalism, which arrogates to itself the right to your experience because they've stepped out of first values and first principles. That's what C.S. Lewis was referring to. He said that he, he predicted it 70 years ago. He said the conditioners are going to step out of the Tao. Once they step out of the Tao, then they're going to become the man molders, right? That's Skinner, right? And in fact, right, Skinner dies, Pentland develops with all the other data scientists, the mathematical models, and then says, hey, Facebook, hey, Google, let me collect everybody's data, feed it into machine intelligence, develop a personality profile, and then based on that precise information, we'll actually be able to directly influence the outcome of an election, for example, because we're going to know every wavering voter and we're going to know the unique pressure points, right? Social pressure points, right? To exert on this group of voters to make them vote in a particular way. And we're going to know exactly how to make people buy exactly what we want them to buy. So we're going to upend the two basic human institutions of democracy, which are the voter and the consumer. Democracy is going to become a sham because there's no real voting because of all of machine intelligence is arrayed against you to actually manipulate your voting choice. And you don't even know what's happening. And machine intelligence is not minor. We're talking about machine intelligence that's so sophisticated that it's completely defeated the old machine intelligence that defeated the best chess masters in the world in the 1980s. So we're talking about an exponentially more powerful machine intelligence arrayed against you, right? To exert a form of behavioral engineering to impact your decision-making both as a consumer and a voter. Now that's being deployed now in democracies and it's just beginning because as we move to from over the skin surveillance to under the skin surveillance, deploy biometric sensors, which everyone's gonna need in order to join a health system or to get insurance or to get a job. There's gonna be so much data coming into big data that the people that own the data will essentially create digital dictatorships. Wow, there might be a veneer of a democracy, but democratic elections are gonna become a joke. And there might be the veneer of an economy, but your independent decisions of a consumer as a consumer are gonna become a joke. The entire drama of human decision making is going to be upended. Right? Wow. Like, wow. Now, here's the paradox, right? In big tech, you have this utopianism, and as they've adopted Skinner and Pentland, but because the big tech founders are all postmodern, means postmodernism is the deconstruction of value. Postmodernism says, there is no actual value. It's all, as Harari says, Yuval Harari, in several of his books, it's all fiction. These are all social constructions of reality. There is no genuine unique self. There is no genuine true self. There is no irreducible human value. Value is a complete human fiction. So when you marry right, the postmodern surveillance capitalists of the techplex 
you get the conditioners that C.S. Lewis predicted, who've stepped out of first values and first principles, right? Creating this behavioral engineering system, right? Wow, whoa, whoa. Did everyone begin to get that, right? That is, that, that's the scenario that we're in now. Now the response, the response is to actually develop and share, right? So that Zuboff gets it, because Zuboff doesn't get it. Zuboff just critiques Skinner, doesn't understand that he's responding to existential risk. So that Pentland and his data scientists get it, right? A new model of self and a new universe story. The new model of self is true self and primarily unique self, an evolutionary unique self, the move from homo sapien to homo amor. But at the core of everything, it's the unique self model. And then we have to infuse the techplex, the nervous system of the planet, which means the algorithms, the data algorithms of the nervous system of the planet have to be infused with unique self. Unique self has to be the animating energy, right, of the nervous system of the planet. So we need to respond to social self with unique self. We need to respond to reductive materialism with the universal love story, the amorous cosmos. Right? It's these new narratives, it's this evolution of the source code, which is essential. And that evolution of the source code needs to then infuse the source code of the data algorithms that are now hijacking authority in society today. Authority in society today is moving from governments to algorithms, right? Wow, but algorithms are written by human beings and human beings download into algorithms value, right? So either they down download social self, that's the value. So the value that's been downloaded now into algorithms of the social self, which is the constructivist, the social construction postmodern value, right, of Skinner, Pentland, all the way to the techplex, right? Wow. So when we get to Google and Facebook and we read their lovely slogans, we realize, oh my God, this is Skinner in disguise. Whoa. So the response, the response is the radical downloading of evolutionary love of homo amor, of unique self, of the amorous cosmos, of the intimate universe into the techplex. And that takes us from digital dictatorships to digital intimacy, right? The digital world's not the enemy. The hijacking of attention for the sake of social control is the enemy. Now, last piece, let's notice one more insidious dimension which we can't miss. What the techplex has done is the techplex has the techplex, the surveillance capitalists have married the direct profit and power motive, meaning Sergey Brin, Larry Page, the whole gang, tens and tens of billions of dollars are individual net worths because they've profited from harvesting your data in violation of the first principles and first values of personhood. So there's this immense greed motive. There's this immense power and profit motive and they've married in the techplex power and profit, sons, first values and first principles with utopianism. Does everyone get those three pieces? So there's the surveillance capitalism, which is absorbing all of your personal experience as data bits, pouring them into machine intelligence, out, out, out pouring them into machine intelligence, let's get, let's get the word and then, then printing out as it were from the data science mathematical algorithms of machine intelligence, your personal personality profile, which is exactly your points of social pressure and manipulation and then selling it, right? And the more data they get, the more predictive analysis becomes more accurate. The more predictive analysis generates more profit. Facebook this quarter, Google this quarter, did better than they've ever done before, despite all sorts of public attack. The best quarters they've ever had before because right, they're getting more and more data and therefore selling more and more predictive analysis to third parties. Imagine what happens when a dictatorship actually owns data. The greater your data set is, the more developed your machine intelligence is, the more you're able to develop predictive analysis. So what happens when when actually this is now used by China, which is actually happening now, right? Think about the social control there, right? Think about how sophisticated artificial intelligence becomes. We actually need to, right, convene the world 
right, in a shared story, right, a shared story based on shared first values and first principles. And one of the first things we need to address when we create right, global intimacy is who owns the data. The data can't be owned by private companies in this particular way, right? We actually have to, right, who owns the data is who runs the world, right? And if basically the data is owned by a bunch of private companies owned by about 25 people, so we have actually the conditioners, right, who are actually running the world despotically. So there's this strange, and what we've done here is diagnosis. We've identified the mixture of surveillance capitalism with its profit power agenda, together with utopianism, Skinner and Pentland responding to existential risk, and that utopianism being adopted right, by the founders of the major techplex players who are all surveillance capitalists. And all of them are postmodern, right? That is to say, without first values and first principles. And an early postmodernist, although he's before the postmodern time, he died before postmodernism really took hold, was actually Skinner. Right? Skinner's a behaviorist, right? Materialist, right? Who basically says interiority is off the table. Not a bad guy. He was a utopian, a beautiful utopian. Walton II is a completely beautiful book. Right? And of course, Skinner himself stood for value. He just, he just thought that value was a social construction because his view of universal values, right? He said, there's no way to articulate that, right? He rejected C.S. Lewis's natural law and he was right in rejecting it. Everyone catching this? He was right in rejecting it. C.S. Lewis's natural law actually didn't understand evolution. And I'm sure that Skinner would have loved our notion of evolving first principles and first values. I'm sure Skinner would have come on board in that. And, and Skinner, I think, could come on board on a notion of true self and unique self. Right? But those models didn't exist in society. You ever get that? Those models, they didn't exist. The only model that existed was separate self. So Skinner says, we've got to move beyond the separate self. We've got to move beyond the freedom and dignity of the separate self. Not because he's a bad guy, like Zuboff said. That's actually a Buddhist critique. But he was stuck because he didn't have unique self. So he could only go to social self. And so social self became the animating energy of the nervous system of the planet. What's our job? Our job is, oh my God, we're going to evolve the source code of culture and consciousness. And evolving the source code of culture and consciousness is the evolution of love. And we're going to talk more about this is part one. We're going to talk more about it next week. But what we've tried to do is crack open here, right? Literally, what's going on all the way on the inside, right? Right? What's animating the techplex? And here's the paradox. I'm just finished last minute and a half. Shoshana Zuboff gets exactly half of it. In other words, she's horrified at the techplex. She does a magisterial job of detailing, right, the structures of, of surveillance capitalism. She details 16 different structures. Great job. But she doesn't understand, A, A, the existential risk that we're facing, right, the objective existential risk. She pretty much ignores, mentions it a couple of times, number one. But number two, she herself has stepped out of first values and first principles. So she gets really angry at the techplex but she, she can't root her anger at the techplex in first values and first principles because she's actually, right, speaking a kind of postmodern story, right? And the postmodern story is rooted in modernity, which says that value, including the value of the individual, is our best social construction, but it's not more than that. So paradoxically, Zuboff says it's really important to name surveillance capitalism because only if we name it, Right? Can we actually transform it? But she, she won't name first principles and first values. So she says, I'm going to arouse astonishment and outrage when people realize what surveillance capital is doing, surveillance capitalism is doing. But she doesn't quite arouse that astonishment and outrage because you can only be generally outraged when you experience that there's an actual violation of value. But objective value, real value, not constructive value. If value is just fiction, well, then maybe the social self is the best way to go. It's only when you get the first value and first principle of personhood, right, of uniqueness, that you're outraged. Now, the reason Zuboff doesn't adopt first values and first principles is because she doesn't have a conception of it, right? She, she thinks, wow, all there is is natural law. Natural law got dismissed by the academy. So the best we have is the old liberal order, right? But here's the deal, Shoshana, right? Post-modernity took down the old liberal order. So throughout her book, she refers to the liberal values of individuality, but postmodernity took those down entirely, right? Entirely. That's been deconstructed. So we have to, we have to now engage in a reconstructive project. 
And it's only a reconstructive project, right? Post postmodernity, in which there's a set of evolving first values and first principles that we can actually muster the outrage that Zuboff magisterially and gorgeously seeks to invoke. Without first values and first principles, we don't know why to be outraged that Google has decided that it owns our data. Well, why wouldn't it? It's not against the law. It was, it was unprecedented in 2000 when Google decided to, to mine the data exhaust right, of our web participation and it realized that that data exhaust could be converted by machine intelligence right into a text and sold to third parties. It wasn't against the law, right? It wasn't against anything except for first values and first principles, but no one had articulated first values and first principles because postmodernity said it's all a social construction of reality. Wow, right? So paradoxically, Zuboff herself is in some subtle sense allied and aligned with right, the overlords of the techplex who she attacks because both of them refuse to embrace first values and first principles. Zuboff relies on the old liberal order which is easily explainable as a social construction, as a, as a fiction. And the postmodernists of the techplex, right? They adopt the social self because they don't have any first principles or first values of uniqueness or personhood. So we're not here to get angry at anyone, right? We're here to be outraged at this reality. These are not bad people, these are great people. But it's our job to, to actually make the Da Vinci move. We're at a time between worlds. We're at a time between stories. So the overwhelming moral imperative for those with eyes to see is to take our seat at the table of history. Well, right, and evolve the source code. New narrative of identity, new narrative of self, new universe story, new narrative of communion, not social hive, unique self symphony, not social self, unique self, not natural law, evolving first values and first principles. Wow.